lax, but they want to get caught up on what happened during the day. That's where we come in. Our goal is to use our different personalities to try to bring you into what's happened during the day, and then we can all share together. Evening Express, weekdays 5 to 7 Eastern. Look at this. Not something you see every day in court, is it? Two cars involved in a deadly crash parked outside a courthouse. Uh, prosecutors in the John Goodman DUI manslaughter trial brought the vehicles to court so jurors could examine the evidence up close and personal there. Uh, okay, I want to bring in former prosecutor Dan Shore as well as in session law enforcement analyst and contributor Mike Brooks. Mike, I, I want to ask you, I saw you out of the corner of my eye looking at those those cars yeah. and you were shaking your head what's your first thought when you look at this just the uh, the sheer damage to the cars yeah. from the from the impact of that uh, of that Bentley that weighs 5600 pounds into that Hyundai that's 3600 pounds mm. Christy uh, it, it's amazing and when you heard Snellgrove say that the Bentley almost went through that car yeah. the first thing I, I thought if he had not have drowned he may have been killed just from the trauma involved in the accident. Because I tell you, as a former invest police investigator and as a former fire officer, I'm looking at that car and I've done a lot of you know, extrications, disentanglement of people who've been in wrecks like this. And I tell you what, that would have been, it would have been a long extrication process getting him out of that car, mm -hmm. just cutting him out of that car uh, had he not rolled into that canal. No kidding. Unbelievable. Um, and a passenger, they wouldn't have stood, stand, they, I mean, that whole passenger, passenger would have done it. It would have been, yeah, it would have been DOA. Well, Dan, let me ask you, I, this seems unusual. I mean, and, and even the pictures we have of these cars outside the, the courthouse and people that are gathering around to look at them. Mm -hmm. uh, what, to bring the cars in like that? I mean, that's, that's not normal, is it? It's not normal, but in this case, it's really important for a few reasons. First of all, as a prosecutor, you always want to connect with the jury and make the evidence and the facts and the people involved real people, not just abstract. And we've seen impressive videos of accident reconstruction. We've seen other evidence, but nothing compares to actually seeing the cars. I'm sure your viewers who have been watching this have been hearing the evidence, but when they see that picture, mm. the two pictures of the two yeah. cars, there's a visceral reaction of the people inside and what must have happened to them. Second of all, the defendant originally said that he stopped at a stop sign before mm -hmm. going through the intersection. And you look at the damage to those cars cars and that really undermines that statement because you can't imagine that kind of impact if someone really stopped at a stop sign and then slowly went into the intersection after that. So it bolsters or it helps the prosecution's case and it also brings it home to the jurors as real cars with real people inside them and the real tragedy is strengthened. And yeah, because I'm wondering what the impact is for jurors to see this firsthand as opposed to seeing the pictures and I think you made a good point there. Dan about how it brings it home but you know Mike is an investigator what would you tell an attorney uh, to emphasize when showing these cars this uh, these actual pieces of evidence to a jury well you know I, if I, you could I think it was very powerful that they went outside and looked at these vehicles and they went back up and they heard Snellgrove again describe the whole scene and 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 as Mr. Shore said he's absolutely right I would stress that if he stopped at that stop sign, you would not have the damage, even with a 5,600-pound car with a V12 engine in it, could not get up the speed and the inertia from a stop at a stop sign to maybe 35 feet, if that, into the middle of the intersection at that point of impact to do that much damage to that Hyundai Sonata. Look at that picture right there after in the tow yard. That shows you, you know, that's that, the, the, the maximum impact right there maximum contact and it's it's amazing because it, it did it almost went through that Hyundai Christy. and you look at that and you think how could he not have been more hurt yeah well it's because of the airbag uh, and because of the the, the weight of that car, that car and the way that car is built it's an extremely extremely well-built car but if you look at that whole animation uh, that that Snellgrove put together it's it's amazing and the technology and accident reconstruction has come so far in the last number of years I wish that we had this technology when I was an investigator we probably would have made uh, been able to make more cases because you can take this and you can use this for a terrorist bomb and you can use this for a robbery to recreate anything but it's just it's amazing what they did on the reconstruction of this accident. Dan, uh, I know you're a criminal defense attorney and you mentioned how going out and seeing these vehicles firsthand undermines uh, Goodman's 
contention that he stopped at that stop sign. From a defense standpoint, what do you do to get give some more credibility to your client because he just lost an awful lot with that one what many people would perceive is a lie. Well, I'm actually a former prosecutor. I'm not a defense attorney, but you do look at a case as a prosecutor from both sides to see the strengths and the weaknesses. And this really hurts the defendant in many ways. The other way that this helps the prosecution is that the defendant left the scene. He didn't get help for the victim. He says he didn't see the car that he hit even after he hit the car. And when you look at the damage to these two cars, it's hard to imagine that he really didn't realize that he had hit the Hyundai because that's his allegation. That's his defense, that he never saw the Hyundai. That's why he didn't help the victim who was drowned. That's why he left the scene and didn't report it right away. But you see the damage here. It's really hard to believe that you have that kind of impact and you don't see the Hyundai. And the defense has a big obstacle to try to overcome that evidence. Okay, well, Dan, let me ask you this. I mean, that you, you say it and you're right, but at the same time, uh, there was a, a witness on the scene, Nicole Okoro. She's the first person that had called 911, and she, j just going through that intersection, admits on the stand she didn't see the car a car other than the Bentley she got out she she looked and she didn't see anything because it had fallen into the canal so is it fair to think that Goodman got out of that car and didn't know what happened well that witness didn't see the Hyundai at the right. time that the Hyundai had dropped into the canal which was down below the roadway the defendant is saying he didn't notice the car even at the time of impact which is different than the witness who came by later when the car was in the canal and you look at the damage to those two cars you could just imagine the impact and then to believe that he didn't even notice that he struck another car when those cars were in such damage it's that really um, flies in the face of a reason and it's different than the woman who came by later when the car was already in the canal mm -hmm. So, Mike, what, when you look at a, I mean, you just look at these, I cannot get over the damn, you don't even know what that is. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at that, you don't even know what that is. That is a mangled mess. Yeah, full of, uh, full of uh, debris from the canal and, and grass, and uh, it, it, it's, it's unbelievable. Now, you know, it, it could be feasible, could be feasible, Christy, that at the impact, he got out and he looked around, he didn't see any car, did, but did he, did he really think in his mind at the time? depending on what his mental state was, depending on what his sobriety was, did he think that the car or whatever he had just hit was able to drive away right. even with the damage that was done to his car if he didn't walk over and look down into that canal? But he didn't even see the car, you know, and he said, mm -hmm. I didn't see the car coming. Well, it's not like as if he pulled out because he is the striking vehicle. It's not like he went through the stop sign and Wilson hit him. He went through and just hit Wilson broadside, and uh, I mean, right at, mm -hmm. you know, you talk about maximum engagement of these two vehicles. Uh, it, it was right, you know, boom, right there. And you see that stop line, and you see where the point of impact was. There's no way that if he had stopped at that stop sign coming south on 120th South, it, it, right, boom, and then get that much speed at the point of impact. Right. There's no way, no how. Well, and it, it's frightening to look how at how far it traveled right once there. they hit. Yeah. I mean, you'd think that they would at least stop on the road itself, but it went so far as to throw it into the. Canal. And that's why they believe he was going at least 63 miles right. an hour. Okay. Hey, Mike Brooks and Adan Shore. Thank you both so much for sharing your expertise with us today. Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. We're taking you back inside the courtroom for more testimony here as lead investigator Troy Snellgrove talks about uh, uh, what's coming up next and the, and the defense. Well, actually, Snellgrove getting ready to be cross-examined by the defense. If you walk all the way to the end of that driveway, you're going to eventually uh, come to an opening, which is where Lisa Pemberton's trailer is. Is that right? Yes. You did not see any footprints on this driveway. I did not, know. Tonight, Seth. Seth wants to sell you my store. Is busted.